Hi everyone, Professor King here. In this video, we will be discussing how to find sources that are adequate and satisfactory for a college level research essay. Um, in a previous video, I mentioned, you know, that we're still at the stage in this course where we're just dipping our toes in the water of what it means to find sources. So um, I want you to keep that in mind with the information that you're getting here, because um, you know the expectation isn't that you're an expert tomorrow on how to research. Everything we're doing is incremental so that we learn a little now, a little bit later, a little bit later, a little bit later, so that by the end of this course, by the end of your college career, you'll look back and say, wow, all of those little learning moments amounted to some really big knowledge, right? So. Keep that in mind. Don't don't stress too much. You don't have to be an expert on everything today. Again, we're just at the stage where uh, research wise, we're dipping our toes in the water. So I'm going to take it to a share screen. Before I do, I always like to remind you uh, to pause where you need to pause and take notes on this video. Go back if you need to go back. Um, if you have questions, comments or concerns, please make sure that you either email me, message me via Canvas, or visit me during my Zoom office hours. Again, I'm avoiding pronto, <laughs> so uh, try to avoid pronto yourself as I probably won't respond on that platform. But all the other platforms, I'm, you know, I respond within 24 hours. All right, let's get going. <laughs> I'm going to take it to a share screen, and then we'll take it to um, our PowerPoint. And um, start from the top. So we're talking about finding sources, and this is chapter 46 of the Norton Field Guide to Writing uh, in the fifth edition. If you have a different edition, it might be a different chapter, but that's where uh, the gist of this information is coming from. All right, so let's talk about kinds of sources. We have to know what we're looking for before we actually look for it, right? So we've got two kinds of sources typically at this stage in a college level research course. The first one is a primary source. So it's a source that reflects information created at the original time of study. And you may say, well, what does that mean? As with so many things, I like to use analogy in explaining my approach to pedagogy. And so I'm doing, I'm doing the same thing right here. So if we think about a primary source, it's like the source that was happening at the time. So a primary source might be like, um, you know, if you're researching the sinking of the Titanic, a primary source might be like uh, a news article from, when was it, 1917, 1919, whenever it sunk, uh, a news article that explains what happened, right? A primary source might even be like, the diary of someone who was on the Titanic, right? It's something that happened at the original time uh, of this phenomenon being studied, okay? If we think about it in terms of like music, right? Let's say like, and I'm, I'm assuming that most of us in here have heard of the, the band Black Sabbath fronted by lead singer Ozzy Osbourne, who oddly enough has the same birthday as I do. So uh, you can look that up if you're trying to uh, butter me up by the end of the semester, just kidding. But if we think about Black Sabbath, right? Black Sabbath, their lyrics, their records, their songs, you know, as long as they're not covers, that's all primary source material. In other words, they created it. If we were going to research Black Sabbath, we would go straight to the primary source, which would be, again, the stuff that's created at the original moment when they were around initially right 70s I know they're all still kind of doing a thing they're they do tours or whatever but any of the any of that is fair game as long as it's you know the original sort of source and time of study now secondary sources are they come slightly later they don't have to come way later right they don't have to come like 100 years later like my Titanic example but they they come after the primary source because they are things that put the primary source in context, right? So like a secondary source would be like the movie Titanic because it was made, you know, a little under a hundred years later and it put that into the context of like a romantic movie. It's a secondary source about the Titanic. Um, 
you know, if we're using this music example that I'm sharing with you, there's a band called Max Sabbath. It's like a joke band. They've toured locally. Um, they're kind of like a sludgy metal, you know, stony kind of band. Um, and they play Black Sabbath covers uh, with the theme of McDonald's characters and food, etc. So in other words, they are putting the lyrics, the music of Black Sabbath in context, in the context of a joke, in the context of songs about McDonald's, <laughs> you know, in a later context. So that's why they would be a secondary source on Mac Sabbath, if that makes any sense. Okay. So keep that in mind as you're looking for sources, primary versus secondary, because the closer we can get to sort of original information about the source, uh, the better we, we are, but we also need stuff that contextualizes it in a way that interests us, right? There could be another band and, you know, you could call them, uh, you know, Slack Babbitt, and they could be all about like being a slob, right? To the tune of Black Sabbath songs. Um, so that would be a different context to put Black Sabbath in, right? You could make uh, a documentary about the sinking of the Titanic. And that would put uh, that would put the context into a historical context, right? As opposed to like a romantic movie context the way that James Cameron's movie did. So that's why secondary sources are helpful because they provide the context that we want to approach the research with. We also have scholarly sources. These, these are typically secondary, but they can also be primary. So, you know, again, we, we have to avoid thinking about things in sort of what, what is known as essentialist terms, meaning like these categories are not entirely concrete and distinct of one another. Uh, a primary source can be a, a scholarly source. A secondary source can be a scholarly source. Um, and where you're gonna find these is typically through our library webpage. When you go into the library, and you click on EBSCOhost, right? In that little white search box that's on the front page of the library website. And EBSCOhost, if you'll see, if you notice here, it's a search engine in the same way that a Google, that Google is a search engine. However, Google again is generally populated by ad generated sources. Whereas EBSCOhost is generated by and large by scholarly sources. Does that mean that everything on Google uh, is not scholarly? No. Does that mean that you're going to also perhaps find like things like magazines on EBSCOhost? Yes. There's a little bleed over in both categories. However, for the most part, EBSCOhost is scholarly, right? Based in research, based in academics, whereas Google is ad generated based on consumerism, based on, you know, what we as consumers in a capitalist society are buying. That's the difference. And think about it. What information is going to be more reliable? Something that someone did for the pursuit of knowledge that they're not getting paid for, because trust me, I've written these articles before, or something that someone's trying to sell you. The first one, right? So keep that in mind. So when we're so we need to be using scholarly sources in our academic writing. And yes, there is Google Scholar. Um, but the thing about Google Scholar is it often makes you pay for scholarly articles because again, ad revenue, money revenue, capitalism. Whereas when you go to EBSCOhost on our library website, you're getting those for free as a student of the college. So that's why I say, yes, you can, you, Google Scholar is helpful and it's got a lot of great stuff, but it makes you pay for them a lot of times when you shouldn't be, when you should be accessing this um, you know, through, through free academic research vis-a-vis -vis our, our library website. So when you're looking for these scholarly sources, you want to look for an author, right? Make sure that it has an author and that could be, um, a group, right? Like the CDC or, um, you know, uh, the Institute of Public Health, right? Like, um, those are teams of researchers that put this information out. So those are okay. Individual researchers are also great. But if you're getting information that just doesn't have an author and it's just some sort of op-ed off the internet, that's something you got to look out for. 
because scholarly art articles are what is known as peer reviewed. And what peer review is, is okay, so like I have a graduate degree in English Lit, and let's say I submit an article um, in a scholarly journal that's going to end up on a place like EBSCOhost. I submit that to a panel of researchers in my field who have masters and PhDs in this subject matter, who are well versed and well read and well studied in the things I'm talking about, who then look over my research and say, does this pass muster or does she need to go back to the drawing board and fix some stuff, right? So that's what peer review is. It's typical in scholarly research uh, by and large. Whereas, you know, stuff that's articles that are, are, are just submitted to Yahoo or to Dumois or wherever else, they aren't vetted, right? It's just like, here it is. You don't have a panel of 10 people looking over the research they did. Um, look for source citation, because again, you need to cite properly in your work cited, so you got to get the hang of that. Look for who the publisher is, because some publishers, um, you know, engage in various forms of bias. So you want to make sure that it's from a reputable scholarly academic institution. Um, look for language and content, because again, something that is going to be scholarly is going to use a certain language, a certain level of sophistication to their language. Whereas something on Medium or on Vox is going to be very easy to read. If it's easy to read, a lot of times that's your cue that it's not scholarly. Um, and also uh, make sure that things like advertising or images or sort of flashy, wacky designs, those tend to be again for like stuff that's ad revenue generated, whereas scholarly stuff <laughs> like this, uh, it tends to look pretty boring. It's a lot of words and not a lot of like, ooh, you know, flashy images. We, we're, we're totally patronizing our audience. <laughs> um, yeah, scholars don't do that. They're like, here's the information. You're smart enough, read it. Because you are. And they, they respect you enough, you know, to, to acknowledge that. All right, so more kinds of sources. There are popular sources. Um, these aren't written by experts. So pretty much anything you find on Google for the most part, like a Time Magazine article or Psychology Today, like those might sound like they have some cachet behind them, but really they're popular sources, right? Time Magazine and Psychology Today and any, um, again, any sort of like glossy magazine for the most part is not trying to really further the complex pursuit of knowledge or the pursuit of complex knowledge, I should say they're trying to sell you stuff. And so you wanna shy away from using those popular sources because that in and of itself creates a bias. Uh, then you have reference works, encyclopedias, bibliographies, dictionaries. These are great jumping off points and they are, you know, they're, they are rigorous. I'm not gonna take that away from them. They're, they're academically rigorous. However, they're a jumping off point. So what you wanna do is instead of uh, citing an encyclopedia or using an encyclopedia or a dictionary, please don't do that, for your research, you want to use those as starting points where you then can find other research. Like if you're looking up an encyclopedic article about, you know, a jellyfish, it's probably going to be a couple paragraphs. That's not going to give you, you know, the depth of the evolution and lifestyle and existence and and you know broad classifications of all different type, types of jellyfish it's just a starting off point to give you kind of the basics then from there you get keywords you get ideas to go look um, and perform even more rigorous detailed research um, we have the library catalog um, part of which i showed you on the last page um, an, a database which was ebscohost and that's where you find those articles and periodicals and again, we're on day two of talking about research. So as the semester goes, I'll show you more and more how you navigate those. And the library has wonderful resources to show you how you navigate those. All right, so kind of building on the idea of reference works. Again, for general reference works, like an encyclopedia, try not to put them in your essay. They're usually too general and you can find general more pertinent information, but 
they can be used as, like I said, like a diving board or a jo jumping off point where you can then immerse yourself in even more specific and thorough research. So use them to, to generate ideas for keywords. Um, there are specialized reference works, like a lot of our textbooks are specialized reference works. If you look at like, you know, say a history textbook about, uh, you know, the American West from 1850 to 1900, like that's a specialized reference work. Um, they're topic specific, still possibly a little too general for research, but again, a great starting off point uh, in terms of getting to the specifics of your topic. And then we have bibliographies and, and bibliography works cited. They're slightly different things. However, for, for all intents and purposes at this level, we'll just say that bibliographies and works cited are essentially the same thing, right? Um, bibliographies usually come at the end of a rigorous academic scholarly work. If you've ever had to create a work cited, you are creating your own bibliography for the research you did. Um, and the misconception about works cited or bibliographies is that they're used to make sure people don't plagiarize. Yes, that's true when we're talking about evaluating college work, but the real reason why we have bibliographies, why we have those works cited at the end of a, you know, of a scholarly work is not to make sure that the scholar plagiarized. Because when you're talking about people who then you know, have master's degrees, PhDs, the odds are they're not plagiarizing. The odds are they're research junkies like myself who are doing the work so that they can publish their findings uh, again to, a, to, a, to an academic audience. So what are they used for? Well, they're actually used to help people researching look over the research that the writer of the article did so that the person reading the article goes, oh, that's, that's a really cool piece of research that will help my research. I should check that out. Or, oh, that, that totally talks to the topic I'm looking at for my research. I should use all this information, you know, the author's name, the title of the work, where are they found the work. I should enter that into an academic search engine and read that thing myself or watch that film myself or, you know, whatever. So that's what you should do. You should look through those to find out who and what the researchers researched to help your own research, 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 research. Um, <laughs> so I hope that clarifies. Um, again, library.fullcall.edu is where you're gonna find databases like EBSCOhost that I talked about a few slides before and the print, not the print boo catalog, the print, even though Halloween is probably fast approaching as you're watching this video, uh, the print book catalog. Yes, we are like an internet society at this point. However, as someone who was still around at the dinosaur that I am, when a lot of research was still done in print books, uh, I can tell you that they have a lot of value and they've got information that sometimes you just don't find on the internet, especially looking at things like primary sources. Uh, you know, if you, if you go to a university from after this, where they've got, let's say um, an archive lounge or historical works that are kind of kept under glass and things like that. I got my master's at Loyola Marymount and they had, they had one of the first folios of Shakespeare's published, you know, like within, either within his laugh, lifetime or published within like for 50 years of his death. So this is like, you know, a 400 year old document that they have at LMU of Shakespeare's work that I as a researcher got to look at and go, wow, what a trip. I wonder, I wonder, you know, what the, what the, what the publisher used, like who, you know, who's printing this, what they're focusing on, like, that kind of stuff is really cool. But there's all, all other uses for print too. Especially like if you're a lit major, not that it, you know, not that there's a ton of us out there, but if you're a literature major, um, searching print books is helpful because libraries have them for free. One of the things I did in my undergrad because I was broke all the time, working two jobs, going to school full time, you know, living on, urine stained couches and out of my car at points. Um, I was broke. So one of the reasons I became a literature major 
was I could get Herman Melville or <laughs> uh, Zora Neale Hurston or James Baldwin, any of these writers that I loved, I could just get their books for free at the library and I didn't have to pay for them. So that's where print can also be helpful is in these libraries where this knowledge is free. Um, okay, so how do we use keywords when we're searching? I'm not gonna spend too much time on this because you all as younger people are even more knowledgeable about how to use keywords than a dinosaur like me. So I'm not gonna pretend it, that you don't know how to use keywords. So I'll zip through this, this slide. So one thing that's really helpful when you're researching is use synonyms. Uh, you know, if you're looking up an article on, I don't know, uh, homelessness, right? Um, and you put in homelessness and you either get too many searches or too few, you might wanna play around with your keywords a little bit. You might wanna use instead of homelessness, housing insecurity or just housing or rent control or you know whatever, whatever word that, that best speaks to what you're looking for and play around with those words because the more different types of synonyms you use, the more search results you're gonna get. Um, and when we get to advanced keyword searching, you, I mean, you all know this. So again, I'm not gonna belabor this point, but use quotation marks around a phrase to get that exact phrase. So, you know, if you're, if you're looking up Kanye West, you wanna put Kanye West, all of it in quotation marks so that you don't get articles on like the wild, wild West, right? <laughs> um, because if you don't put them in those quotation marks, that might happen. If you put and into a keyword search, um, it's for more than one keyword included in the article. If you put or, it's when you're looking for several items that may or may not be separate. And when you are when you put not, like, um, like West, not Kanye, right? Or West, not wild. Um, then it looks for terms with the word West without those other, keywords in it so that you know if you're looking for an article on the wild wild west you don't get a ton of articles about kanye and vice versa all right um and this i'll just kind of leave right here for a second these are periodicals uh searching indexes or indices depending on how you pronounce it and databases that are helpful so these ones in green are when we go to the library website Keep these in mind because these are the ones that you should be using for your scholarly, rigorous academic research. And look, EBSCOhost is right on the list. Um, you can also search by single subject, like if you're doing a particular research project for a sociology class or for a biology class, a history class. There are indexes and databases, indices and databases that speak to those specific subject matters. So you can find those on the library website. And you can use print indexes. Again, print is still reliable, still valid. Um, so if you go into the library in person, they might have some great print indexes, indices in there for you, especially if it's material that you need to find before the 1980s. They might even have it on microfilm or microfiche where they kind of condense it and you can look through it uh, on like this little like conveyor thing, um, but print is still helpful. And I think this is the last slide. Yeah, so just remember um, to, again, you, you are all smarter than me on how to search the web. So just review what the textbook says about that in this section. Um, but because this class requires academic peer reviewed sources, I just want you to remember to evaluate your sources. And avoid Wikipedia, avoid Google at all costs. Just like I said about encyclopedias uh, and certain bibliographies being a great jumping off point, Wikipedia is a decent jumping off point to give you ideas about your subject matter and give you a general overview, but it should not be used as a source in your essay. Uh, and I think most of us get that at this point. So I, again, I won't belabor this point. All right, so I'll take it off share screen now. Um, if any questions or, oh, and one more thing, 
before I just totally leave this video, I do want to show you the library website um, so that some of these things that I talk about in this video, uh, I know I'm I know I'm I'm using a lot of fillers right now. Sorry. The things I talk about in this video, I'll show you how to access them very quickly right here. So this is our library webpage. It's library.fullcall.edu. Another way that you can find it. Another way that you can find it is by going to the Fullerton College page and just in the top right corner, clicking on that little thing that looks like a book that takes you to the library. So library.fullcall.edu, same exact page. Where you want to look in terms of looking for catalogs or databases or print sources is right here on the front page. So this is the OneSearch box, or if you know of a specific catalog or a specific database, like the ones that I mentioned on the slide, they're going to be here. Um, if you know a specific journal that you're looking for, like the title of a scholarly journal, you can put it in. But the easiest way to kind of, uh, you know, get a wide net around everything is just to go to OneSearch and then look up a term, right? So let's see. where it leads me. All right, so I'm here and look, one to 20 out of 45,000 entries. I know that some of us love to research. I don't think any of us are going to look through all 45,000. And this is one search. So again, it captures everything. Um, so we've got a book about Kanye here. We've got uh, juvenile nonfiction. What I would say is, let's say we want to look at mm, more recent research about Kanye. So we go from 2015 to 2021 in this little sidebar here. That narrows it down to 18,000. So let's see if we've got anything um, that's full text. So anything that has all of the information, the entire article, whatever. Okay, we're still at 18,000, right? This is the 18,000 I'm referring to. So let's see how many scholarly journal articles there are about Kanye West from 2015 to 2021. When I click on that limit, woo, that cut it down a lot, right? Um, so now we have 13 scholarly journal articles. That means that in that 18,000, there was a lot of stuff that wasn't scholarly, right? It was ad revenue generated. It was probably too simplistic. It was probably not relevant. So now we have 13. And this is the kind of stuff, right? When we look at this, even though we're talking about something popular culture related, these are people who are scholars who have master's degrees and PhDs who are talking about the cultural impact that Kanye West's music and work and life have have had on society, on American society and beyond. So this is what I'm talking about when I'm talking about scholarly research. This, these aren't the kinds of articles you're going to find on Google. These are scholars looking up this information. So if I backtrack, just to give you an idea, right, I narrowed it down several times. I put the quotation marks around Kanye's name. I searched all library sources that were scholarly review, scholarly peer reviewed and full text. And that's what I got. And if I just work backward from all of those limits, I end up right back at the library website, right at the beginning of the search engine page. So that's, again, that's just a brief, and I'll take it off stop share now. That's just a brief sort of toe in the water about how to use the library website to find sources, uh, any sources. They don't have to be about Kanye West or the Titanic. They can be about anything you're searching for. So I hope that helps. Again, email, Canvas, or, or Zoom if you, got, if you have questions. And uh, I hope you all have a great rest of your day and weekend. Bye.